So, good morning, everybody. My name is Sebastian. I'm a software architect uh, working for Rewe Digital in Cologne, and I'm going to talk about our journey with microservices, which uh, now lasts for five years, and we'll cover a bit which decision we've made at what point, and I'm going to tell you if we're still happy with our decisions. Uh, spoiler alert, yes, we are. So, uh, I will start with a little uh, history uh, where we're coming from. Maybe not all of you know about the Rewe Group. Um, it's a big employer in Germany. We have 350,000 employees and 15,000 shops. Uh, it's different industries. It's food retail, as most of you know it, the, so the, the Rewe stores or the penny stores. We also have a lot of tourism and do-it-yourself, so uh, Tom Baumärkte, you might know. And we have a pretty long history of over 90 years, and you can imagine that this makes things sometimes pretty difficult. For instance, um, explaining people what open source is and why we might need that uh, does not everybody un understand. So that's, uh, some things are quite difficult. You might remember some of these brands. So we have Rewe and Penny and Narkauf. These are the food retailers or discounters in, in Germany. We also have uh, ITS and Dare Touristic. And if you're from Austria or Eastern Europe, you might know Billa or Bipa. And in the middle of that uh, is, is my company, so Rewe Digital, and we are, yeah, it's a, it's a stunt that many companies do these days, so we built a whole new company uh, for the purpose of driving the digitalization. So that's what we do, and we mainly uh, work with the Rewe Core brand, so when the... The analog process was that we wanted people to come to our stores uh, and uh, go through the through the um, to the to the lanes and grab their food and go to the cashier and carry stuff home. Then the digital process is we want them to sit at home and click on the website which items they want, and then they can choose if they can if they want to pick it up at the store or we deliver it right to them with our delivery fleet. So I'll give you a, a short overview over the first five years. So uh, when, the, when Rewe Digital was founded, um, people pretty early wanted to have a running uh, system, so they asked the agency to set up the first shop system for them. That's what they did, and in the beginning of 2014, when we hired our first um, development teams, they took over this system from the agency. That was pretty straightforward. It was a, a Java Spring application with struts front end, so nothing special, and not too worse. Um, soon later, we hired our first architect, and uh, he was asked to think about how we could scale that. So how can we make sure that one day we can have 20 or 30 teams working on this system? And he pretty early came up with the conclusion that that is not possible with a monolithic system. So you don't want to have 20 or 30 teams on the same repository and taking place in the same uh, deployment process. So he said, okay, let's try microservices. And he, we did that not because we thought it's cool from a technology perspective, but we wanted to scale. We wanted to have many people working on the same system and we wanted to grow fast and wide. So that's, that was our decision to go for microservices and nothing else. We also uh, had then something we call squad concept that's a little derived from the Spotify model, uh, so that's just a way of organizing ourselves. I will cover that in a, in a, in a slide a few minutes later. Um, in the beginning, we had microservices that were Debian packages. So we had Linux hosts, and everybody had to provide a Debian package. That was okay in the first place, but not very convenient. So we then, in mid-2015, introduced Docker and Docker Swarm, so that we um, made the first step into the virtualization. In 2016, we launched our a new app, so we had an app before, but this was only for finding out what's the nearest market or uh, what are the current offers. But with the new app, we were able to, um, to um, have the whole e-commerce process in there. And we were able to do that with only microservices. So there was no communication between the, the apps and the old monolithic system, and that was all proof that this is actually working. And uh, back then we had already 20 teams, so there was a lot of growth from 2014 to 2016. Uh, by the end of the year we were already 30 teams, and then we found out that our old subdomains were growing too big, and then we cut out one subdomain into a core domain, which was fulfillment. So in the end of 2016 we had three platforms, e-commerce, fulfillment, and big data. Um, and in the end of 2017, we um, started to launch our marketplace. It was a 
big shift in our, in our business because we will not then only uh, selling our own goods, but also the goods of our partners. And this was going live in 2018. And in the middle of 2018, we launched the Food Fulfillment Center. You might heard from that in the press. That's pretty cool because um, in, the, in the old model, the, the picker, we call this, these guys, they move around the alleys and, and pick the, the food from, uh, from, the, uh, from, the, uh, from the shelves and put it in, in a bag and carry it somewhere else. And in the new system, we have some automatic railway system where the goods come to the people that pick them. So he has to just to turn left and pick an item and put it onto the right, onto the, into, the, into the box for the customer, then both um, boxes disappear into new baskets. Uh, uh, boxes appear, and this, uh, th and this way this uh, can be much, um, much, much faster. Okay, um, from a different perspective, this, this, is how, uh, this is how our growth looks like. So we started with one service, the monolith, old, old monolithic system, and two development teams. And in the end of 2018, we had around 270 services and 48 teams. And this is roughly the um, number of teams we have right now. So um, no more growth uh, till then. Um, some words on our organization. So we are... Our, our organization is pretty much derived from domain-driven design, so we have uh, domains, uh, which consists of subdomains, which consists of bounded contexts, and from a technical perspective, we have a platform, so one platform fulfills the requirements of one domain, and one service implements a bounded context. Sometimes it's one-to-one, it's -one, but mostly it's many services um, build up one bounded context. And from an organiza organizational perspective, we have tribes. A tribe builds a platform. A squad takes care of one subdomain, and one team builds a service. And again, it's not one-to-one. -one, it's roughly four to five uh, services per team. So just that you know these, uh, these words, they will come up in, in later slides. So now back to square one. Uh, remember, our architect had to somehow find a way to scale the monolith. Um, I already told you we didn't do that. We actually uh, got rid of the monolith and, uh, and started to work with microservices, but how did we do that? Hmm. Okay. Uh, so we had, in, the, in, in the beginning, we had two, um, uh, two major design goals. The first one says decentralization, and that means that we didn't want to have one big code base and one big deployment process anymore, but we wanted to have different and independent units of software where each team could work on, think on, and deploy and operate each service whenever they want to. And the second goal was to have vertical boundaries, so we didn't want to have uh, technical layers. So um, if you, uh, let's, let's say you have a front-end team, a back-end team, and a database team, then this will end up in a three, classic three-tier layer application. So we, we didn't want to have that. We wanted all these technical layers in one, in, in, in each service, and this means it's, it's vertical, and each team has a, a purpose or a context they work on with all the different technical layers in there. So this slide is pretty mandatory for a, a microservice conference. Uh, so just shortly, Melvin Conway stated in the 60s that um, every organization that builds a system will always copy their own communication structure. Um, so that means that if you want to have vertical pieces of, of software, we need to have vertical build-up teams. So what we wanted to have was something like this. Each team consists of, of different aspects, for example, front-end, back-end, database, QA, ops, analytics, and so on and so on. And then you can staff your teams with these abilities. That doesn't necessarily mean that you have one front-end guy and one back-end guy and one database guy and so on, but you need to have these, um, these aspects in, in, in the team. And then we could, could uh, staff our first team and tell them, well, um, here's your, your first context. At don't remember what it really was. Let's say it was search, and we told them here, take the search out of the monolithic system, build up a microservice, set up a new uh, um, search indexer or something, and go on. And then we did a second team, and a third team, and so on, and we did this a couple of times. So now that we knew how to set up our teams, our next question was how to determine boundaries, how to find a way to give each team a context. What, what is a good strategy to do that? So one approach would be, yeah, let the teams choose 
here is, is the old, the old uh, big ball of mud, take what you want and make a microservice of it. Or you can say, uh, we, 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 we uh, take a look at the data and say, oh, this piece of data belongs here and this piece of data belongs there. But what we also wanted to achieve was that, in the end, not every team is talking to every other team, but there, there are kind of natural relationships between teams. So I have neighbors, which I talk to more often than I talk to the people on the other end of the, of the, uh, of the application. And so what we did is we, we looked at the main business processes, and the most important business process for e-commerce is the customer journey. So we first have the customer that enters our site, and in the end we have a bag of groceries that is delivered to the customer's doorstep. And so we have we, uh, set up four blocks there. The first one is called customer check-in. So this uh, contains the processes um, of, of having a customer checking in. So it's, uh, it's uh, login and registration, and it's something like choosing a service or market you want to be delivered from. That's what the teams and the services cover in this building block or squad. Uh, the second one is called product discovery, and uh, that's pretty important for us because in a normal e-commerce uh, system, customers buy three, four, five items maybe at max. In our case, it's 40 to 50. So if you want to do your week grocery shopping, you need to have a lot of items in your basket. And therefore, we need to make sure that, that the customers find the stuff they need. So we need a really good search, we need recommendations and stuff like that, and so we have many teams working on in, in this block. Then the next one is pretty classic, it's checkout, so we need to have a um, shopping cart, a checkout process and payment, for instance. And the last block is fulfillment, so that's a, that are all the processes of having the food actually delivered to the customer. Unfortunately, we have also some horizontal layers, which didn't fit into the, into the vertical ones, so that's, for, in, for instance, product information, because every of other of these squads needs product information, so we couldn't decide on where to choose it, so we made a horizontal layer. We have some back office um, processes for, for example, marketing, which didn't fit either. Then we have mobile. Um, the problem with mobile is that you cannot ship a mobile application in pieces. You always have to have one application you can put to the uh, Google Store or the, or the, um, to the to the App Store. That's the reason we have to we have to have a separate mobile team and not distributing the mobile uh, developers onto the other teams. And we have a, a platform team which do all the infrastructure and some services that don't have a clear business, um, business value. For example, um, email gateways or SMS gateways or something. So, um, in 2016, we realized that this fulfillment block was growing really, really big because there's a, there's a lot of software. We have to have, have all this uh, storage uh, software for, for maintaining the storage. We have software for tour planning and so on and so on. And we realized that this was growing very big and we decided to move one subdomain and make a new core domain out of it. And this looks roughly like this. So um, we divided this fulfillment block into four vertical blocks, and they go along the line in which the, um, the, the good is actually brought to the customer. So it's inbound, the process of having the, 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 um, the, the, the goods coming from our suppliers into our storage, then we have inventory, then outbound, the process of m moving the, the, the goods onto our trucks, and realization is the process of actually driving the stuff to the customer. And again, we have some, some horizontal layers like master data, back office, and again, a, a platform. So this is what the birth of our second platform, and we also have a third one, which is big data, which, is, have, has, which had uh, different reasons we, 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 we did that, because a big data team looks much different than, than other teams. They have data scientists in there, and everything they do is pretty much different from what the other teams does, so we said, okay, that's worth having a own, own platform just for big data. Okay, now we knew how to staff our teams and we knew how to give them a purpose or a context to work on. But now imagine you have 40 or 50 teams working and they all cover up the whole technology stack. How do you make sure that it's still some, some uh, system or architecture that works together? And we have a three layer of what we do to, 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 to make that uh, sure. First thing I already told you are the design goals. The second layer is we have architectural principles. It's basically nine 
laws which everybody has to has to fulfill and they are pretty pretty coarse grained so it's not very clear how to do that exactly your, your teams have to take care of that but how they deal with that it's, it's up to them and these principles are around uh, autonomy automation and, communica and communication and we'll go through these uh, principles in a minute and on the third layer we have things that we need the teams to strictly do uh, like they should be done. For example, authentication and communication between services. We cannot have uh, teams come up with, uh, with new uh, forms of communication or something. This must be like this. And therefore, we have guides there that are held in this uh, RFC 2119 style with must, should, could, so that we can be sure that things are done as we need them. So. What are our um, architectural principles? So the first block is about autonomy, and this is pretty important for us because we want teams to work as autonomous as possible. We want, don't want them to have to talk to different teams or to other people all the day. We want them to spend as much time as possible in developing new features. So how do we do that? We have four principles around that. The first one says deploy independently. So we never ever want teams to say we have to wait till the other team has deployed or even worse, we have to uh, deploy our stuff at the same time as the other team does. So this must be sure that it's independent and if it's not, uh, we tell them go back to the start and try again. Second principle says isolate failure. That basically means that we don't want any of our failures coming out of a service and uh, having other services forced to care about that, or even worse, to have a failure um, bubbling up to the customer. So this must be as resilient as possible. And this also means that a service always expects other services to fail. So we want, for example, we want circuit breakers in place uh, when synchronous communication takes place. The third principle says we want to hide implementation details. So every team has to provide a proper API and you don't have to care, you, you, you shouldn't have to care about what type of technology or what framework is underneath there. And that most of all means that we want to be stateless. So uh, something like sticky sessions or so uh, should, not, should not happen. And the fourth principle says encapsulate data storage. I think this is pretty basic for microservices. Every service has their own private database and if I want to access a, and another service's database, I don't just connect to the database, but I ask via their API to receive the data. There are three classic enemies of autonomy. Um, the first one is bloated features. So that's what we had, we had big problems in the start when product owners or stakeholders came up with very big features <coughs> that that took many teams to fulfill. And we always ask them, please cut the features into smaller pieces. MVP is a quite, uh, uh, quite famous word. We have some minimum viable product. Start small, take few teams, let them build a system, and then make a feature bigger over the time. This means that we do have, yet they have fewer teams per feature and they have much lesser um, synch synchronization overhead. Second enemy is Big Bang releases. That's something that, uh, for some reason, the stakeholders often want. They want to have the feature from 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 zero to to 100 uh, right now. And we, it was quite uh, quite difficult to tell them that there are better patterns. For example, we you can make use of test groups to just launch a feature for uh, some, pri some 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 friendly testers, also just one percent of your customers. Then learn how they accept that, how they work with that, and then. Um, Make, make, uh, let, let more uh, customer have this, have this feature. So there's, there's a much smaller risk and even um, uh, lesser need for synchronization in the first place. And the third one is, uh, yeah, it's a little difficult. Um, uh, many teams coming from other companies or, or from, from, from university have a big urge for, re for reutilization and shared libraries. So everybody learns that uh, one piece of business code should only exist once and, or one technical solution should only exist once. That is not really true for microservices. We tell them, don't repeat yourself, isn't the, the big goal. It's totally okay to write everything twice. So wet is, is no dry. And for instance, we, have, uh, we had some... Um, teams that uh, built up some library, for example, a logging library, where everything was like our guide says. And then they built up this library, and then they, they uh, put it into some, re to some repository and told the other teams, um, well, you, you, we, we, did, we uh, did that already, you can use that. But the problem is, then we're, we had 10 or 15 teams using that library, 
And then there was some, uh, some, some version upgrade, I don't know, from Spring Boot 1.5 to 2.0, and um, this was suddenly not working anymore. And now you have 15 teams not able to move to another major version of their, of their application framework. So we say, don't go for shared libraries, rather write it twice for yourself, then you're totally autonomous, and if you want to go for shared libraries, then you have to make sure that there's a team which 24-7 is able to maintain that and to do these version upgrades and stuff. So, but as long as we don't have that and you don't want to uh, be, be, be uh, responsible in that way, then rather write everything twice. The cool thing about autonomy is that it opens a tech stack, so we can offer our uh, engineers a uh, uh, variety of platforms and frameworks. Most of our services are written in Java and Spring, but we also have Scala teams and Clojure teams and Kotlin teams. And on the infrastructure uh, side, we have um, also Go and, and Node.js. And uh, on the infrastructure side, just to make this complete, uh, two of our three platforms already moved to the Google Cloud, so we're making a lot of use of Kubernetes there right now. Um, and also Kafka, which is our only way uh, of asynchronous uh, communication. And we make a lot of use of Ansible because everything, every system we build up is completely automated via Ansible playbooks. The second set of um, principles is about automation. Um, we want the work be as automated as, as possible because we don't want the teams to do manual steps every day. So the first principle says be scalable. So every problem that's around um, memory or CPU or I.O. should be solved by scaling your service horizontally. So if you're on three instances and you, and you realize, okay, that might be too few, then you should be able to shoot up two other instances uh, in, a, in a short time. Second says, in general, we want to embrace a culture of automation that says testing, deployment, and operation should be as much automated as possible. Um, for instance, we, we have some teams that were uh, commit to get leads into an automatic deployment on, on, on uh, production. That's the, yeah, the royal version of that. Not every team does that, but there are some teams that are so sure that they have automated everything that they do this, this way. And the third principle is, is, says, be highly observable. We embrace our teams to go to production early and often. And if something breaks, that's, yeah, that's, that's bad, but it's okay if you realize that it's happening early. So we provide a lot of infrastructure to our teams. Every team has several big TV screens in their space, and we have a Kibana stack in place and uh, Grafana Prometheus so that every team can build up their, uh, their monitoring on these, on these screens and realize if something really goes wrong. The third set of principles is about communication, and this is just two. One says we want to have standardized service communication, so we need to stick with, this, with the standards we have. So it's not okay for one team to come up and say, hey, we still think SOA is a great idea, here's a WSDL, and here you go. So that's not how it works. Um, we have REST for synchronous communication and REST uh, maturity level two, so we want to have proper resources and proper HTTP methods, and we use Kafka for asynchronous uh, communication, no discussion. So a microservice basically looks like this. Uh, there are three, uh, um, three versions of, of, an, of an API. We have a REST API with a JSON payload. We have an eventing API, which is basically a Kafka producer or consumer. And we have a new I API, and this is pretty special for us, and I will cover this in the end of the talk. So, um, I'm pretty sure you already heard this stuff, but I uh, just mentioned it anyway. Um, if you build up your microservice infrastructure with only HTTP, HTTP REST, you will sooner or later run into problems. This could uh, somehow look like this. You have a gateway with a request coming in, and then you have in this sample five services which take place in this, uh, in this uh, request. If one of them fails, we have a problem. There are some patterns you can use to, to ease the pain, so you can have proper timeout set, uh, you can have fallbacks if the, if, the, if the call actually fails, you can have circuit breakers, which is mandatory for our REST communication, 
but these are patterns that somehow ease the pain, make it better, that might help you that not the whole infrastructure goes down because of some overflowing uh, thread pools or something, but it doesn't actually solve the problem. What does solve the problem is uh, something we call eventing, which is basically asynchronous communication. I'll give you a quick example. Uh, what we mean by that, uh, so we have a, a service called customer data service which takes care of customer's core data, so it has an, has an uh, HTML and REST interface where the customer may change his, his core data. And he puts that into his own database and everything that's put into the database is, on, is, is uh, also published on uh, Kafka queue. Then there might be another service, the invoice service, which is capable of rendering an invoice and he collects all this data, puts it into his own, own copy in its own database, and every time uh, a request comes along which needs to uh, render an, e an invoice, he can look into his own data and render the invoice from there. And there's no, um, there's no need to call the uh, customer data service at, at runtime. And there might be a second server, the checkout service, which is also interested in customer data, which has its own database. If you look at this, this is mainly uh, database replication. If we look at the payload, the payload could look like this. We have an ID, a name, a loyalty ID, and two types of addresses. And the invoice service is mainly interested in the name and the invoice address because it's printed on the invoice. And he just takes this piece of data and just leaves the rest out. So it's kind of a filter here. And the checkout service uh, takes just the name and the delivery address. So it's kind of intelligent database replication. Um, so to state, some uh, some things. Eventing is does not mean messaging. Eventing means that we only publish information that's already happened. So that's you 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 should not uh, mix it up with a command. So I cannot tell another service to do something particular. Um, if I want to do that, I have to do this uh, synchronously via REST. So eventing means we want to inform each other about uh, stuff that already happened. Uh, and what's crucial is that there's only one owning service per queue or topic. So if you come to the state that you need two owning instances for one topic, then you should overthink your design. So in general, one owner and as many subscribers as you like. Then uh, our eventing is not event sourcing. Um, that's because we only publish complete entities. So every time one single attribute changes, the whole new entity gets published onto the queue. And this, we do this for, for various reasons. The, the main reason is, uh, yeah, is a little pathetic because uh, even in the year 2019, it seems to be pretty pain for our, um, for our um, provider to put another disk into the rack. So we need to save space. And we do this um, with a um, feature of Kafka called lock compaction. And that basically means if you have... An, if you have various versions of an entity living on the queue, then lock compaction deletes all the old versions and just keep the last version. So if, you have to, if, a, if, a, if a customer has changed his, his data 20 times, then there's uh, version 20 on the, uh, on the queue and the first 19 versions get deleted. So that saves us a lot of space and we can, we can, we can, we can live uh, we can live on. Uh, if when we go to the, to the Google Cloud or the e-com uh, platform, then we might overthink that as well. Um, what's again important is that every owning service is able to rewrite the topic in case of data loss or in case that some new data comes along he has collected and needs to publish that. So everybody has to make sure that via one click everything is uh, populated again. And every subscriber needs to make sure that he can reread all the topics because um, he may also have data loss or um, he might uh, he might realize that he forgot to, to save uh, a piece of data earlier and that he needs it right now for the next feature. So that's what we uh, want the uh, teams to provide. There are some lessons we learned with microservice communication. First thing is eventing is an API as well, so we handle it just like a REST API, and every time a new service comes up, we ask the teams to provide both APIs. What we had in the, in the past is that teams said, oh, we don't know of any client for this, for this eventing API, so we just start with the REST API and, and, uh, and implement that later. And the problem is, you can guess, that when the client comes along and says, we, we, want, to have, we want to collect your, your events, then the team doesn't have time anymore. You know, our, our, our backlog is that long, and maybe you can come back in two or three months or something. So this is why we say an, 
eventing and REST are just one, two different uh, views on an API, and we need to have this both um, implemented from the start. <coughs> Then we realized that writing generic APIs is hard. As I mentioned in the beginning, our first client was a mobile application. And back then, the teams were talking a lot to the, to the, to the mobile team, and the mobile team says, hey, we would like the API to look like this and that. It would make it easier for us. And the team said, yeah, okay, well, no problem. But when the second and third client came along, we had, we had problems because this was more a mobile API and not a generic API. And then we had, we had to learn the hard way that writing a generic API isn't that, isn't that easy. And the third thing is uh, breaking changes, and breaking changes are uh, a real pain for us, um, because imagine you have 10 or 15 teams sitting on this API and you need to make a breaking change. Then you need all the teams to move to your new API, but, and, and you need to maintain both APIs until everybody has moved from the old to the new one. So, and teams, in the beginning teams, pretty often came to us and said, oh, we need to make a breaking change because there's a typo or there's something that isn't, isn't really nice, we want to change that, and we told them, no, that's, that's not a good reason. You really have to find a really strong reason to do a breaking change, uh, and, we, and we, we, we want you to avoid that as long as possible or find other solutions to keep the old API um, in place so that we don't have to, to do this really hard and... Um, expensive API changes. So now uh, we have these, uh, all these nice um, microservices. Now there's the question, how do we access th that? Uh, so that's nothing new. I think this is what most, most companies do. We introduced API gateways, and um, we have three different gateways. The mobile gateway serves the uh, Android and iOS application, the UI gateway serves a browser application, and the terminal gateway serves the um, terminals in the market. If you go to Rewe Market in, in Germany, you might see these uh, payback Rewe terminals in the market, so we also provide these with, with data. And our, our uh, API gateways uh, have basically three tasks to do. First one is authentication. So there's a protocol in place between the client and the gateway, where the gateway can find out if who is this who's, who's uh, calling this, uh, this, this resource. Um, then we have routing. So um, we have um, self-service interfaces in place at every gateway, so each team can register to uh, have the gateway route uh, certain uh, requests to their service. So, for example, if they have a new feature, a, a new, new fancy feature, then I can say, please, Gateway, everything that comes below a slash new fancy feature comes to my service. So, there's a lot of uh, self service so that the Gateway teams don't have to have uh, such uh, repeating tasks every day. And the third thing is composing in terms of the mobile Gateway. That means that we don't want um, the, the app to, to access many services for just rendering one view. So we make, mo we make a one call to the gateway, and the gateway does all the um, needed requests in parallel. So let's say we need five different microservices to, to provide data for one view. Then there's one call to the gateway, five parallel calls to the, to the services. Then everybody returns their uh, JSON, and the JSON gets glued together and is brought back to the, to the application. This way you can save a lot of performance uh, for, for the application. And in terms of the mobile gateway, composing means something different. Remember, in, the, in, the, in the, one of the first slides, I told you that we have front-end guys in every team. And that's an approach that is pretty, diffi uh, that's pretty di uh, different from other companies. Most companies have an API landscape, and they put a horizontal front-end application on top of that. And uh, we think that is DDD only halfway. So we say uh, we want front-end guys in every team, and they provide the, uh, the piece of front-end that this service is good for. So for example, if you have search, um, then you need a search bar, and the front-end guy in the search team lives in the search team, and he makes sure that the, the front-end for the search bar is correct. So, last thing in, in this uh, talk is about what we do with front-end. So, what we want to achieve is something like this. This is a, um, a product detailed page of a banana, and we have one team that is responsible for this, uh, for this page, and let's call it product detail team and they know how to build up a 
product detail page and, and they have a template for that and they know there's a picture and there's a description and ingredients and stuff. But they don't know how to provide a header. They don't want to know what is what lives in there, but they want to have just a placeholder in their uh, in the template that tells the gateway, please fill in the header in here. And then we have a header team, which is only responsible for, for rendering a header, but they have no idea how to do a proper main navigation or a search bar or a basket overview icon. So they have placeholders in their markup as well. And this way, every team provides just the front end that is responsible for and where they have the expertise for. So the search guys know the best what the search must look like. And the, um, the big pro is here, every time something has to be changed, for example, in the search bar, we have a better um, type ahead algorithm or some new, new markup in there. The team can deploy that when they want without talking to any other team. So there's no need to talk to a front-end team uh, and, and talk about when we could launch this feature. And the front-end team says, no, we have no time. We have to uh, make a feature with the basket guys right now. So we have everything in one place, and this team is fully autonomous and can launch this feature whenever they want. Another nice thing is, as you can see here on the, on the right side, there are two uh, includes. We call that from the basket team. So this is uh, add to basket button that comes from this team and the basket overview. And uh, you know this behavior from many e e, uh, from many e-com sites that when you push the button, then the amount in the upper corner changes. And if this would be two different teams, we would have to make sure that there's a protocol somehow. So we, they have to choose if this is uh, um, plain DOM eventing or if we have Postal JS or something in place. But this is done by the same team. So they can choose one thing or they can change that whenever they want without ever touching another team. So this, again, brings us much autonomy here. So under the hood, how do we do that? Um, we have a component which is written by us in, in Node.js which we call DUC, which is short for Dynamic UI Composition. And um, I will guide you to the, to the basic steps we have there. So whenever a request comes from a client, um, the gateway first uh, does the authentication and looks, who is this? Then the session gets translated into HTTP headers. So every service can, uh, can look up what the actual session looks like by looking into the HTTP header. So we have a... Uh, customer ID in there, maybe a basket ID, uh, whatever it is. So the Duk has some, uh, this uh, gateway has to make sure that all these headers are in place. Then we look up um, the test group. So every customer can be in, in a certain test group um, via a given percentage or via a zip code or something. And then the test groups are um, translated into an HTTP header as well. Then the root has to be looked up, so one service knows the template and this service is called and he returns the template, and, but it may contain placeholders. So then the um, gateway parses the markup, looks up which service must be called for the includes. This includes get, caught, uh, get uh, called uh, in parallel and brought back to the gateway and then we have to look again, are there includes in there? And this may take place up to four times, so the four times is the maximum depth we have there. Uh, which is um, pretty pretty fine grained, and which is also uh, the yeah the the border in which this is still um, in in which we have a good performance, and uh, then finally everything is, is is looked up. Then all the JavaScript is put into the body of the document. All the uh, CSS is put into the style section of the head of the document. We don't make one big file of that because in times of HTTP2, that's okay to have many small files in there. And then the page is returned to the customer. You might think that this is pretty slow and uh, giving not a good performance. We have spent a lot of time in uh, having a really good parser in there because the, the, the most time-consuming part here is, is, is a parser to find all these placeholders and all this markup because the markup might get really big. And we use a lot of caching. So, for instance, it's not necessary to go to the service and fetch the template every time because the template doesn't change every minute. So it's okay to cache that for an hour or two. So, and we, we, and we, we also do that on the include side. So every, on every level, you can have different times of, of um, caching in there. So every service, when, when, they, when they return a piece of front end, they can say, um, oh, this is, uh, you can keep that for 10 minutes or an hour or something. So we make a lot, uh, use a lot of, a lot of caching, and that's how we got this thing um, performant. 
And we think this is the more DDD-like solution than having a, a monolithic micro front end because of the advantages I told you about. Uh, the good thing is that we finally uh, um, came to the point that we could uh, tell our 90-year-old organization that uh, open source is a good idea and we will open source this, uh, this library, I think, at the end of the summer, if everything goes well. So if, you want to, if you're interested in this kind of uh, dynamic UI composition, you might, you might use that. Um, right now, we have a GitHub repository called Integration Patterns, where we have a lightweight Java version of that, where you just can look around how we, how we do that. And what we also have there is um, a Kafka library, so a consumer and a, and a publisher, which we think are programmed in a good style. So if you're interested in that, you can have a look at this, this repository. It's roughly about integration patterns, how to let different microservices uh, provide data or UI to one final single application. Okay, and I think that's it. And I think we have 10 minutes for questions, right? Okay. Frontends are responsible for very small pieces of, of the of the page. So, uh, is this true that then the, let's say that there is one front end responsible for just a basket, and let's imagine that I'm a yes. front end for a basket. I work forever, and I'm responsible for one button. Not only one button, as you can see here, the basket team is, is, uh, is responsible for the button and the overview, and they also have a, a basket overview page or something, so it's just different pieces of front end. But it's true that we go to very fine detail here. So we say adding an item to a basket is a business process that the basket team knows best about, and it might be not a good idea to let every team, maybe the, the search team and the product detail team, to, to implement this. Right, so we do it once properly, and we allow uh, um, integration in the, in the front end. But do you share front ends in between the teams? Because I cannot imagine that I'm like for a year responsible for one button. Like so what we do? Uh, maybe you could back to this slide. So every service has to provide REST API with JSON, and they have a UI API, and there might be one API for the button and one for the overview page and stuff. So every time I want to do something that naturally belongs to another team, I can choose to, to, uh, to do a REST call or better to do an asynchronous call. But if it's a complicated thing with business logic, business logic in there, then it might be the better idea to fetch the uh, final front end, uh, piece of front end and put it into my page. Thanks. Uh, yeah. You, um, generally, uh, you said that the motivation for this uh, was uh, to be able to scale horizontally, right? Uh, but you haven't mentioned uh, any numbers. So, uh, what would be the number of uh, requests per second that you uh, have in your peak times? That's the first question. And uh, if you have an idea. How many orders of magnitude uh, more uh, can this architecture scale in the future, if you need to? Uh, I don't think I have a real answer for that. So right now it's, it's fitting, and most of our services are running in two instances. So we'd, we were not even forced sometimes to, to, to grow horizontally. Our, uh, our gateways, so the, the UI gateway, uh, I think is running in 10 instances, but it's uh, Node.js process, which takes 60 megabytes of space or something, so we can, could scale even further. So right now it's okay, and we don't think about that this is coming to an end from a performance perspective. And what, what, what was your second question? The first question was how many requests per second you have? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> it, it, it just works, so. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Hey, another question? Um, I, I think this uh, um, vertical teams is a really good approach, and I would like to see it grow perhaps in my company a bit more. But I'm interested in quality and uh, <coughs> testing. 
Mm -hmm. um, how do you maintain a high standard of quality, a high standard of page load time across teams who perhaps only think about their own concerns um, and and you know have the, that, might want to use the attitude, well, it works for us, and you know if it's causing conflict, then it must be something yeah. on your stack or something. Yeah, so, uh, and especially end-to-end -end testing, who's responsible there? Okay. Yeah. Uh, so what we have is uh, we have different uh, different communities of practice. Uh, for uh, cross-functional topics, for example, we have a um, thing we call architecture guild, where all where every team can provide somebody to talk about architecture and how to change that. And we also have it for, for QA. So there's a group of people talking about QA constantly, talking about best practices, what should be achieved and what not. Um, one problem we have with the micro front end is that we cannot test this before going live. Right? The, the final composed site is only visible after everybody has deployed. And for that reason, for this end-to-end -end testing, we have a very small test suite that just contains the happy path so people, uh, somebody can register, log in, put stuff into their basket, check out, and so on. And this very small um, test suite can be used by every team. So every team can integrate this into their, their uh, deployment chain and they make sure that when their stuff is built that the this happy path is still running. So we say we don't need that much end-to-end -end testing because we want the, the, uh, the components proper tested, but we don't put so much effort in end-to-end -end testing. Hi. Um, you mentioned that you handle the authentication uh, in, uh, in gateways, mm -hmm. uh, but how do you ensure security between uh, microservices? Uh, so what we do is, um, for instance, in a browser application, we have uh, something that's very similar to a JWT token, which is signed and encrypted so that only the client and the browser can, you can communicate. And between the services, we have what we call machine tokens. So every, uh, every service has a client and a secret that can be fetched from an authentication service. And um, every time I talk to another service, I have to provide my machine token. If I don't do that, the other service might respond with uh, unauthorized or something. But in general, inside one platform, we have uh, yeah, a pretty high degree of freedom, so we don't have scopes or something. So we don't say this service may only talk to this service or something. So we rely on that we are on, have only good people in there and no, no evil guys. And um, yeah, you need to have a secret, so there's some basic... Um, authentication there. And we say that every service is responsible for authorization. So if somebody's coming up um, and wants to see some data, then every service must to check that the guy who's calling is actually the one owning the resource. So that's kind of divided between the gateway and, uh, and the services. Okay. I don't have the, the order in, in place, sorry. <laughs> so, um you said you're going to production rather often with your changes, I believe. So how often did it happen that you needed to roll something back? So is it like once a month or only once every few months? I don't have the overview of, of all the teams, but we have something in place called a blue-green deployment. So switching back is really fast. It's just an instant. So we have a active and a inactive strand. And when you go to production, you just switch these two. And if you, if you want to switch back, you could just switch back as well. So that sometimes happens. And it's, it's happening in a, in a frequency we think is OK. And we need people to learn from that. And we need them to write a test for something that fails and to have a good monitoring. So we don't see too much issues with going to production fast. We rather see the advantage of going forward more, more fast. Um, thanks for a great talk, by the way. Um, uh, the dynamic UI composition part was very interesting. I'm just wondering, do you see any GraphQL in the future? Um, yeah, that's a topic we sometimes discuss about, but the thing is, if we could go to GraphQL, we have to uh, change all the APIs we have in there. And we are right now we are stuck with uh, REST uh, maturity level 2, and I think it would be really hard and expensive to go for GraphQL. So this is not an issue right now. Maybe if, if, if we would start the, the, uh, the whole platform right now, we would go for GraphQL, but um, yeah, not at the moment. OK, I think we might have one question left. <coughs> and you know, going back to your um, product page, 
To what page? The product page, the one you showed that right at the end. How do you ensure a visual consistency be between all the different teams? So how do you ensure that one team doesn't choose a library that the other one doesn't okay. want to use? Are you a UX guy? No. <laughs> <laughs> because that's their standard question. Um, yeah, that was a small war we had there because our UI and UX team didn't like that because they wanted to have a very consistent style over all pages. So what we have, uh, we have a, a pattern library for all these front-end components, but we use it only as a copy and paste template. So we want the full autonomy. We don't want some, uh, some central library in there. The only thing we have central is fonts and colors. So this, this can be uh, derived from a central CSS file. The rest is just uh, has everybody in, in, the, in, their, in, in their places. And we think that autonomy is more worth than fully consistency. When you look at, at, at web pages like uh, eBay or Amazon or something, they sometimes look totally different on one page on, 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 uh, on another page. And in the end, we don't have that many pages. I think there's 10, 10 pages in there. And when there's an inconsistency, a team can fix that. But we don't see the need for having everything totally consistent all the time. That's something that our UI and UX guys had to learn. But the, the, the good thing and our advantage is that we can um, provide features really fast. And if we want to have a super consistent UI, that was, would, would, would break us down because we have to ensure this every time. And we have a central front-end team and central UI UX to so have to look over all of this. So we buy more autonomy by getting loose of a little bit of consistency. Okay, then uh, we're done. If you have more questions, uh, I'm around here for the next two days. Just uh, approach me and we can talk about that. Thank you.